Hello and welcome to the channel. My name is Annalisa and today I'm doing a kind of funky idea for a video that I had a long time ago and that has taken a long time to actually get finished. From the title you'll know that it has something to do with reading other booktubers underrated faves. Specifically I got this idea back when I was filming my VeggieTales tag and I was watching everybody else's VeggieTales tags and the second question of the tag is what is a book that you absolutely love but that you can't find anybody else talking about? And so with everybody bringing up all these books that they wanted to talk to more people about but they couldn't find other people who had read them, I decided what if I read all of these books or at least a good portion of them and then <laughs> these people could have somebody to talk about them with and maybe it would like spread a little awareness of these underrated books. And so I picked out five and I put them on hold to the library and I had a long TBR at that point so I was doing this back in November and I didn't have the hold activate until January and it's now March <laughs> because it took me all the way from January until uh, March, specifically the beginning of Femme Fantale, to finish the last of these books. Basically my own procrastination and then a bunch of readathons got in the way. So the full list of titles is going to be in the description so if you want to know where this video is going to go check that out. But let's start with my thoughts on Enchanted Ink which was recommended by Check Her Joy in her VeggieTales tag. And the format of this video is also a little funky in that I'm going to show you some check-ins while I was reading the books and then I'm going to bring you back here to have a full review and recap before we go on to the next book. So here's what I thought when I was part so here's what I thought when I was part way through Enchanted Ink. So now I'm reading Enchanted Ink by Shanna Swenson and I'm actually enjoying it enough, I'm that far through, that <laughs> I think it's a fairly pleasant bath time read. I try to only read things I really want to read when I'm in the bath rather than things I need to get checked off my TBR because, you know, it kind of ruins the point of the relaxing bath. <laughs> So I'm really liking this one. I've also got Northanger Abbey on my Kindle over there, part of the Austin Anonymous readathon, which I'll link below. So I'll be mood reading between these two while I take my bath, which has got some pink bath bomb in it. But basically, this is a very silly book with <laughs> quite enjoyable characters. It's got some mystery and some magical problem solving to do, uh, but it's much sillier than uh, <laughs> What was the last thing I read? Soulless, which is already a bit sillier than, uh, you know, doesn't take itself very seriously. This is very silly, but I like it a lot. So, as I said, it's a very silly book, but it's a very fun book, and I really enjoyed it. The concept is that there is a whole magical world going on alongside our regular world. Kind of like the wizarding world being alongside the muggle world. But there is a little bit of crossover because there are certain people who are kind of muggles who can't use magic but they can see other magical people because the way that the magical people hide themselves from everybody else is with magic and there are some muggle types who are so unmagical that they are actually immune to magic and so when people put spells on themselves to hide their wings for example if they are a fairy these super unmagical people can see through that and they can actually see the fairy because they're so unmagical which is kind of the opposite of the way a lot of magical being able to see magic ideas work usually it's if you believe in the magic or if you're childish enough or you have a child's heart then you can see it but this is kind of the opposite if you're so super anti-magical <laughs> then you can see through the illusions and you can see all the magic in the world around you and so our main character is one of these people who is super unmagical and has been seeing things since she moved to New York City because there's a lot more magic going on there than in the small town she moved from because she is reacting when she sees for example a fairy or an elf or somebody doing magic like magically changing the times of the subways she reacts to that and so the magical people around her are like you just reacted to that you must be able to see it and so she gets recruited by a magical company that makes spells and they recruit these super unmagical people 
so that they can see through illusions and they can make sure that the magical people who make spells are getting tracked by other magical people. And so once she gets recruited to this company, I find it really enjoyable <laughs> to see the various ways they use her. They take her out and have her interact with people they're trying to make business deals with and see if those people are lying to them. They have her sit in on meetings so that she can hear anything weird that's going on and they have her read through contracts so she can make sure there aren't any invisible phrases that would change the meaning of what they're going to sign. And so it turns into part slice of life office worker with regular but slightly magical co-workers who interact with her despite being various magical creatures like an ogre. They interact with her very much like normal co-workers in her old office job, but there is also this large plot thing going on of a specific evil wizard has come up against this nice magical company she's working for and she has to help her company figure out how to fight the bad guys, both in a legal way uh, with contracts and advertising and also in like magical fuddy ways. It's quite crazy. It's a big mashup of lots of things and it's pretty hilarious and I really recommend it. The problem was that I had to uh, request my library to buy this book because they didn't have it in their collection and there are nine or so books in this series and I don't want to make my library buy all of them but I don't also want to buy all of them myself because they're like $15 each. So until I can find these at like a used sale or something I'm not going to be able to continue the series, which is really disappointing because it's just something I feel like I could read to relax and kind of take my mind off the more serious books that I read and the more dramatic books that I read because it was really emotionally light too. Nothing traumatic happened, nobody died, nobody's heart got broken, you know. It's just a light and fluffy book and I would like to read more of that. So I'm really glad that I tried this first one and I will Hope to find more cheap copies of the rest of the series sometime in the future. I will be linking Check Her Joy as well as the rest of these recommending booktubers below. If you want to hear more from the type of people who would recommend these very varied books. Because the next one I'm going to bring up is The Storied Life of A.J. Fickrey, which is recommended by Naomi's Bookshelf. This is about a very snobby, cynical bookseller who lives on a little island and has had his wife die fairly recently and that's why he's cynical. He was always a snob <laughs> but the cynical thing is relatively new and it is about how something happens in his life and things change for him vastly and his whole attitude changes and how he goes from this super cynical snob to uh, this really wonderful kind man who um, didn't have any friends at the beginning or any connections and at the end he has all these people who care about and love him and who he cares about and loves. So here is my reactions as I was reading it. So I'm reading this book and I'm loving it. I am at 162 that far through and uh, I'm really really enjoying it. I was not sure for the first 60 pages or so. I was not liking the main character very much, um, but I was empathizing with him and felt sorry for him. And he was certainly interesting and his life was interesting. He's a bookseller. He owns a little bookshop. He's quite the literary snob. He thinks he can't like any book that's YA and he can't like any book that has vampires, etc, etc. But uh, something happens around page 50 or so and things start to change. So if you try out this book and before page 50 you're thinking of DNFing, hang on till page 70 and see if you start liking it because now I'm really loving it and it's really helping me recover from some very dramatic reads <laughs> that I've been doing. I've been reading the second and third books of the Parasol Protectorate series, which I reviewed the first one of in a video sometime before this, but it was very dramatic and emotional and this is very, it's, there's a lot of emotions, but they're mostly good emotions and they're mostly, it's very sappy and sweet and features some aspects that are really close to my heart if you read it and know what's in it. I'm not sure if it's spoilering because the thing that happens at page 50, like it says on the blurbs and stuff that he gets a gift or a package and I'm, I don't know. It happens early on enough, I don't know if it's a spoiler, but 
things change a lot there and it's the one gift or package that you could get that I think actually makes sense that a person would change their life that much that quickly because his life changed very quickly and then time actually starts moving a lot faster and uh, we get to see his growth over several years quite quickly and overall it's quite a quick read. I think there's not very many uh, words on each page because I got through page 70 not liking it that much but still read it fairly quickly so I think it's quite quick quite a quick read so it's not too much of a risk to try and I highly recommend it especially if you're looking for something relaxing and uh, mushy and touchy-feely and about a bookstore owner and uh, his relationship with other people who like books and his relationships that form among him between other people because of books so that's really nice so I done finished it <laughs> um, I cried tears threatened earlier in the story but they actually fell when I finished it partially because I read the acknowledgments I've taken to reading the acknowledgments because um, I being a writer and being a big reader I just it feels really cool to connect more with how the book was made and who the writer is connected to in their real life and it also when I've read something very emotional it kind of helps me to kind of simmer down and process because I'm still kind of in the story or in the story's world but also I'm gradually kind of getting separated from it instead of boom the book's done now deal with your feelings <laughs> a lot of trigger warnings for this book um, for suicide suicidal thoughts uh, miscarriages and cancer uh, and car accidents and uh, the the weird thing about this book is that all this big serious stuff happened but most time most of the time I was reading it even just after some of the stuff had been described this ring is on the wrong finger. I sometimes use my ace ring as a fidget ring, so I switch fingers with it. But anyway, even right after these bad things that happened in this book, I tr it transitioned really well into more lightness after that, and it just left me feeling light and happy and cozy and sweet. <sighs> and I don't know how the author did that, because usually bad things happening to characters in books just really scars me. And so I don't know how the author did this where she, right? Yeah, she, Gabrielle, wrote this in such a way that these really hard-hitting things could leave me feeling so good because of just all the good things that were happening on all the sweet people and how they handled the hard things in their lives and how how much love and kindness there is in this book and redemption and people who've done pretty bad things I still care about them and they do better things later and it's it's weird it's a weird experience for me this is a very weird book for me emotionally and responding that way to that kind of narrative is not my usual thing so if you're someone who usually doesn't like sad stories or bad things happening to characters in books and you're very um what's it called empathetic like me I would recommend trying this out because uh it it it's very different from the usual kind of book and it didn't hurt me despite having all those elements <sighs> on to a more cohesive review <laughs> And actually, now that I rewatched that footage, I think that <laughs> that pretty well sums up what went on. If you want to know what the mysterious package is that he got, I will put it at the very bottom of the description. Personally, I don't think it's that much of a spoiler, but you might enjoy being surprised by it. But I would have been even more excited to read this book if I had known. So if you'd like more reasons to read this book, go check that out. The next one I finished was Grania, She King of the Irish Seas. I think that's the subtitle. This was recommended by Nicole Pierman, who is one of my best booktube buddies. Not specifically this book, but the author as a whole, because Nicole is super into Irish and Old English uh, stories, and this author specializes in those. On to my reactions. I actually tried a book by this author, author. I actually tried a book by this author previously. Uh, and DNF'd it because I just really didn't like the characters. So I switched to this one, which I was sure I would like because it's about a lady pirate, uh, an Irish one. It's Grace O'Malley is her more common, uh, commonly known name, but her the version she more often went by, it seems, was Grania. So I'm about 100 pages in, and so far the feelings are mixed. I definitely like this one better than the other one, which was After Rome, which was basically a couple of men 
complaining a lot about the fact <laughs> that uh, Rome moved out of England uh, because their epicenter was being threatened right before the fall of the Roman Empire as a whole, I believe. And they were just super whiny and sexist and annoying. And that was really weird because this is a female author, but I noticed in that book, and it, I'm noticing in this, this one too, that <sighs> I had to check the back of the book and look at her picture to make sure it was actually a woman because she seems to write like a guy a lot of times. Like a lot of the really annoying things that men do, like mention women's boobs a lot and make light of uh, sexual assault and stuff like that, she's done that. So it's don't chew on that so it's been really weird um but i am really enjoying this character as i thought so i'm glad that i switched to this book it starts when she is 35 or so i think and and we have some flashbacks to her life pre earlier but it the main narrative is taking place then and so she's established as a commander of a little fleet three to four ships who do both piracy and uh, legitimate trade and it's gone into how she became the what's it called commandant that's what it's called in um pirates of the caribbean i think but anyway where you're not just a captain you're the commander of a little fleet uh how it you're told some of the story of how she did that already and i really like all of that and i i just really enjoy her character and i enjoy a few of the char the men who work for her I enjoy several of them a lot. One thing that's also kind of mixed is the history lessons because there is, both in this book and in the other book I read, this author goes into her research a lot. She's clearly very heavily researched this uh, time in Ireland and England and all of the British Isles. And so she gives a lot of that information in the text and she kind of intersperses it with her pertinent-ish bits of it with the narrative and I feel like the balance is a little bit off for comfort. I would like a little bit less. I really enjoy and find all the information interesting but sometimes she does it at an interesting part of the narrative and then you're like okay can we get done with this info dump so I can get back to finding out what happens next. But starting about page 75 we have a, we've had a really big narrative section and also it turned in, an, in a direction and something happened that I really liked that made <laughs> things better. So uh, I was feeling a little down about it around page 75 but a little shortly after that I felt better about it so I'm enjoying it quite a bit now and those are my thoughts so far. It's a few days later I am now 200 and some let's see 271 pages through Grania and uh, I am much happier there was a while there <laughs> it was reminding me very much of Cersei where I felt like can we please let this character be happy for five minutes uh, but now finally we've reached a more settled sort of place and we have the encroaching English as a constant threat and there's like background threats but she hasn't have had any traumatizing thing happen for the last uh, little bit so that's quite pleasant and I wanted to say that when Morgan Llewellyn isn't, you know, writing like a dude. I really like Morgan Llewellyn's prose in general. It's quite pleasant. And we've, all, and we've also had a long section here of just narrative with only a little bit of historical going off away from our story and just telling us facts. It's kind of strange that she <laughs> started off with that, with more of that um, telling style and then got into more just letting us stick with the narrative because you'd think that new readers would find that kind of off-putting and like stop reading and you'd think it'd be a safer place to put it at the back but then of course there's also when she's giving this information it sets up the rest of the book so that you understand what's going on but it is an interesting narrative choice anyway generally now very much enjoying Grania. so this is a story that really spans Grania's life from when she's a child all the way until her death. She actually lived a lot longer than I thought she would. I did not think that a pirate in those times would live that long, but she did really well for herself. And as I mentioned, there is a rocky beginning and there is a long portion in the middle where she's just having a bad time, but in the end, it ended up encouraging. And I just am so happy to have learned this story of this amazing woman. This was in the time where there were a lot of 
sort of cultural rules around piracy. So you didn't necessarily go around killing all the crews that you came across. There were opportunities to surrender and a lot of crews just got sent off in little ships right next to the coast so they weren't gonna die they were just gonna go land and be poor and there's also a lot of cases of pirates stealing from other pirates and not only from innocent merchant vessels so she's a much more palatable pirate than say blackbeard and i also really loved her personal life it was really interesting there's a lot of it that was probably fictionalized and added to because historical records wouldn't be like that precise but there's a lot of it i think that uh, can be verified with historical documents especially because uh, grania did a lot of interacting with officials she went to prison at one point and she spoke with the officials there and she also eventually spoke with the queen of england elizabeth all of which would have been recorded in actual historical documents she also had multiple marriages which would have been recorded and while a lot of history at the time was oral via bards there are some songs played by these people that we still have access to today so I was really encouraged by the accuracy of a woman pirate being so powerful back in this time that it was really encouraging and gave me another feminist hero. So thank you, Nicole, for recommending this author. I am sure I will be reading more of her books. The next one I finished was The Tubman Command. This one was recommended by Margaret Adele who, by the way, is a big supporter of the indie author community and does tons of indie reviews. So if you're interested in hearing about more indie books, I really recommend you check out her channel. And for the Tubman Command, I actually forgot to record the vlog segments because I got so wrapped up in it once I was into it that I just forgot that I was like reading this to film. And so the Tubman Command is about Harriet Tubman and it's about a very specific part of her life and her work during the Civil War. I thought that it would be a little longer and last over a more significant portion of her time working for the Union Army, but it's actually boiled down to one specific mission that she had to help free one specific bunch of slaves. So in addition to running the Underground Railroad, Harriet Tubman actually eventually worked for the Union Army and she was officially sort of a go-between between, uh, between the white Union soldiers and the black recruits because at this point there were a fair number of freed slaves who had escaped thanks to her a lot and some also on their own and some through military ventures as the north was making successful forays into the south they would free whatever slaves were on those lands and then uh what they wanted when those slaves were freed was for them to come work for the union army so that they could gain momentum and defeat the south but Harriet Tubman was more than just a go-between. She actually led a big crew of spies because she had been so successful in the Underground Railroad. She knew how to sneak in and out. She had loads of contacts. She knew how to blend in. She knew how to go fast. She knew the terrain. And so she ran this network that would report information back to the Union. And so this book is about one specific mission that she and some of her fellow spies went on to get information about a few plantations and where they had planted some, what I believe were basically bombs, in this river inlet so that once they knew where the bombs were, the Union, the union could come in ships up the inlet and free all the slaves on these plantations and hopefully get a really big influx of black soldiers because at the time the union felt like it was losing they had had a bunch of losses and were very much in need of a victory and some morale in addition to some extra support i really loved the historical setting it felt like it was really well researched basically because the author is a historian of this period she is also a woman and though she is white it seemed like the way that she wrote the interactions between harriet tubman and the men she worked with and the women and the men she worked for and the white women who she worked alongside sometimes and she didn't shy away from showing a lot of the racism that was present even among the white abolitionists and the women who were trying to help but who didn't recognize their own prejudices which makes me think that she had uh, good sensitivity readers 
I really enjoyed how much she made Harriet Tubman a person because there's a fair amount of historical records about Harriet Tubman, but there was also a lot that she had to fill in. And just from the way everything fits together and the historical stories that I know, it seems like she did a really authentic job. And once again, a story of a powerful and impactful woman in history means a lot to me. This is the same lady, by the way, who wrote The Hamilton Affair, which I believe was very popular at one point. The last one I finished that I talked a little bit about in my Femme Fantale wrap-up, because I finished it during that readathon, was Into the Drowning Deep, which is recommended by S. Yumi Yamamoto, who is the maker of the Demonathon. And so I do have a reaction clip for this one, because I've actually remembered. So Into the Drowning Deep by Mira Grant is a fantasy horror. It's got mermaids in it. They are the um, siren kind of type mermaids, like the evil mermaids, the creepy ones who are more eelish and, you know, have big teeth and like to eat people. That type of mermaids are in this, hence that it's a horror. And uh, I am that far through, if you can see my uh, marker, which yes, is a tissue. It's because I have boxes of tissues everywhere in the house, so I don't have to keep, you know, finding a real marker. And I have them everywhere because I have horrendous allergies. And the story starts off with in 2015, uh, in this world. So it's set in a real-ish world. A ship was sent out to somewhere near the Mariana Trench to look for mermaids because some cryptozoological type scientists thought there might be mermaids there and they were sent out by a entertainment company that makes cryptozoological films and everyone on the ship got eaten by these mermaids and there's some footage that shows this. Then we skip seven years forward to 2022, so this is set in the very slight future, and technology has advanced past what it is likely, in my opinion, to advance to by 2022, and the environment has gotten more worse than I think is likely by 2022. Like, the fish are all pretty much gone, the ocean is not just dying, but practically dead. I personally don't think it happens that fast. I think this would have made more sense to set in this slightly dystopian ocean world maybe in 2040, but I'm not an oceanographer, that's just my opinion. In any case, this is about, in 2022, another expedition going out to try to find the mermaids again, but be better defended so they don't all die and maybe they can capture one for study. There's quite a lot of setup. We've just encountered the mermaids uh, for the second time on this second trip and you know I'm halfway through. So there's a lot of setup. It was pretty good setup. I like the characters. There's quite a large cast and they're all fairly well fleshed out I think. Uh, but there are some instances, well fairly a lot of instances, of the people being stupid so that they can die trope that happens in a lot of horror. Like people just not regarding warning signs that bad things are about to happen and also the whole second trip out to go see these mermaids when there was relatively good information that they already existed based on video and audio evidence. Everybody on the ship is a little bit stupid to have gone out. Uh, there are a couple of people who kind of knew what they were getting into and were okay with not coming back because their self-worth is not very high, but for a lot of them they were just stupid to go on this trip and then they were stupid to take the risks that they did once they were out on the boat. So um, that's one of several reasons I don't really enjoy horror. I'm wondering who if anyone is going to survive this trip because sometimes in horror no one survives um, and it's definitely up in the air who of this big cast of characters is going to because one of the people we already knew fairly well has died so I'm sure there's going to be quite a few more die-offs which is also not my favorite thing but I'm not particularly attached to any of these characters like I like them but it's not gonna like destroy my soul when they die <laughs> partially because I'm prepared because it's a horror book but also just because stories set in the modern world just don't get to me as much as fantasy so I just 
they just don't get to me as much. So I don't think this one will destroy my soul, but it's taking a very long time to read. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to try to finish this today. This is the first day of Femme Fantale. If I can't finish this today and I just get really discouraged, I'm going to switch to Alana the First Adventure. But you'll see me talking about that in my Femme Fantale wrap up, which will come out before this video. Okay, so after that little filming bit, there were a few more people dying of stupidity. <laughs> but after that, it got a lot better because it actually kind of shifted from creepy horror to action adventure because instead of only being able to run away from the evil mermaids, we were actually able to fight back and one, shoot them to figure out various other scientific ways to fight them. And so one of the basics, one of the big concepts of horror is that you can't fight back and that's what's so scary. Only being able to run and hide makes it a lot more frightening and that versus action adventure where you can fight back. There's just something much less scary about an enemy you can fight even if you're still outmatched. And so after that, the characters made a lot more logical decisions because the author had decided that she didn't need to kill them off so much anymore. Or if they were going to die, they were going to go down fighting, not sitting there being stupid. Also after that last update I found out that one of the characters was autistic and she had kind of been there had been clues to that beforehand but I'm kind of used to a lot of people showing slightly autistic symptoms like Temperance Brennan on the show Bones without them actually being autistic but in this case this character actually was. If I'm remembering correctly her name was Olivia and she's also a lesbian and there is a little <laughs> female female romance in this with a bi character and at the point it was revealed that she was autistic I was like if she dies I'm done. Fortunately this book was written <laughs> in the uh, post 2000 uh, we don't kill off lesbians anymore era which is basically a literary slash TV media phenomenon where lesbians were killed off or other bisexual women, women who liked women, were killed off at an exceptional rate in stories because of homophobia in uh, the older times and we got really sick of that. <laughs> so nowadays if a lot of people are dying in a book, but some of them are lesbians, the lesbians are actually less likely to die because they don't want to fall under that kill off the lesbians trope. So I felt fairly certain they would be safe and I was well pleased with how that worked out. A fair number of other characters died uh, and I liked how it was kind of randomized, how some of them were characters we liked, some of them were characters we didn't like, some of them were characters we knew, some were characters we didn't know at all. So it wasn't, so it also wasn't the cliched red shirt dies. I really enjoyed a lot of the mermaid science but I actually ended up skimming the last half of this book because it was just going so slowly. Like there was a lot of focusing on things that didn't matter to the plot or the characters and things that it got kind of repetitive actually some of the mermaid science because there were a bunch of different viewpoints and so sometimes the same thing would have to be explained to multiple different characters and I found that kind of annoying so I ended up skimming but I read all the parts that had the autistic character in it because I loved her so it didn't totally hold my interest but uh, overall I would say that I liked it because there were a lot of good aspects. The autism rep was really good from my standpoint. Uh, the character was vital and did a lot of good even though she had a couple of limitations and I really appreciated that. Um, the most interesting part to me besides the mermaid science which got a bit meh near the end because because it turned out they were more like human kind of shaped fish rather than a really cool magical creature was the characters and some of the dynamics and backstory of the different characters but I did end up mostly liking the ending. I was a little disappointed that we didn't get to hear more of an epilogue about more of the characters. We only got an epilogue for the female female couple. Everybody else is just like we don't care what happened to them which to an extent I didn't but <laughs> that one scientist and her husband I cared kind of about them and where they were going to go after this but oh well. So that one was a mixed bag for me but I am glad I read it. Uh, it is nice to go outside my regular genres every once in a while especially into a horror that is only partially horror and also has a lot of other stuff in it. So that is what I thought of these other booktubers underrated faves. 
Thank you guys for these recommendations. I only picked five. There are obviously lots of other Veggie Tales tags with lots of other underrated faves to choose from. Some, a lot of them, my library didn't have them because they were underrated. And some of them were genres or authors that I just don't read, like Stephen King. And some, there were just too many for me to read them all. But I hope you enjoyed, and I hope this introduced you to a few books that you didn't know about before, but will enjoy now. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.